Chapter 8. Explorations. Dune had taken to wandering the pipeworks alone. He would go to his assigned tunnel and do his job quickly. Once you got good at using your wrenches and brushes and tubes of glue, it wasn't hard. Most of the workers did their jobs quickly and then gathered in little groups to play cards or have salamander races or just talk and sleep. But Dune didn't care about any of that. If he was going to be stuck in the pipeworks, he would at least not waste the time he had. Since the long blackout, everything seemed more urgent than ever. Whenever the lights flickered, he was afraid the ancient generator might be shuddering to a permanent halt. So while the others lounged around, he headed out toward the edges of the pipeworks to see what he could see. Pay attention, his father had said. And that's what he did. He followed his map when he could, but in some places the map was unclear. There were even tunnels that didn't show up on the map at all. To keep from getting lost, he dropped a trail of things as he walked, washers, bolts, pieces of wire, whatever he had in his tool belt, and then he picked them up on his way back. His father had been at least a little bit right. There were interesting things in the pipeworks if you paid attention. Already he had found three new crawling creatures, a black beetle the size of a pinhead, a moth with furry wings, and the best of all, a creature with a soft, shiny body and a small, spiral-patterned shell on its back. Just after he found this one, while he was sitting on the floor watching in fascination as the creature crept up his arm, a couple of workers came by and saw him. They burst into laughter. It's Bug Boy, one of them said. He's collecting bugs for his lunch. Enraged, Dune jumped up and shouted at them. His sudden motion made the creature fall off his arm to the ground, and Dune felt a crunch beneath his foot. The laughing workers didn't notice. They tossed a few more taunts at him and walked on. But Dune knew instantly what he'd done. He lifted his foot and looked at the squashed mess underneath. Unintended consequences, he thought miserably. He was angry at his anger, the way it surged up and took over. He picked the bits of shell and goo off the sole of his boot and thought, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. In the days that followed, Dune went farther and farther into the pipeworks, holding onto the hope that he might find something not only interesting, but important. But what he found didn't seem important at all. Once he came upon an old pair of pliers that someone had dropped and left behind. Twice he found a coin. He discovered a supply closet that appeared to have been completely forgotten, but all it held were some boxes of plugs and washers and a rusty box containing shriveled bits of what must have once been someone's lunch. He found another supply closet at the far south end of the pipeworks. At least he assumed that's what it was. It was at the end of a tunnel with a rope strung across it. A sign hanging from the rope said, Caved in, no entry. Dune entered anyway, ducking under the rope. He found no sign of a cave-in, but there were no lights. He groped his way forward for twenty steps or so, and there the tunnel ended in a securely locked door. He couldn't see it, but he felt it. He retraced his steps, ducked back under the rope again, and walked on. A short distance away, he found a hatch in the ceiling of the tunnel, a square wooden panel that must lead, he thought, up into the storerooms. If he'd had something to stand on, he could have reached it and tried to open it, but it was about a foot above his upstretched hand. Probably it was locked anyhow. He wondered if the builders had used openings like this one during construction of the city to get more easily from one place to another. On days when his job was near the main tunnel, he sometimes walked along the river after he'd finished working. He stayed away from the east end, where the generator was. He didn't want to think about the generator. Instead, he went the other way, toward the place where the river rushed out of the pipeworks. The path grew less level at this end and less smooth. The river here was bordered with clumps of wrinkled rock that seemed to grow out of the ground like fungus. Dune liked to sit on these clumps, running his fingers along these strange creases and crevices that must have been carved somehow by running or dripping water. In some places, there were grooves that looked almost like writing. But as for things of importance, Dune found none. It seemed that the pipeworks was no use after all to a person who wanted to save the city. The generator was hopeless. He would never understand electricity. He used to think he could use electricity to invent a movable light if he studied hard enough. He took apart light bulbs. He took apart the electric outlets on the wall to see how the wires inside wound together and, in the process, got a painful, vibrating jolt all through his body. But when he tried to wind wires of his own together in exactly the same way, nothing happened. It was what came through the wires that made the light, he finally understood, and he had no idea what that was. Now he could see only two courses of action. He could give up and do nothing, or he could start to work on a different kind of movable light. Dune didn't want to give up, so on his day off, one Thursday, he went to the Ember Library to look up fire. The library op occupied an entire building on one side of Bilbolio Square. 
Its door was at the end of a short passage in the middle of the building. Dune went down the passage, pushed open the door, and walked in. No one was there except for the librarian, ancient Edward Pocket, who sat behind his desk writing something with a tiny pencil clutched in his gnarled hand. The library had two big rooms, one for fiction, which was stories people made up of their own imaginations, and the other for fact, which was information about the real world. The walls of both rooms were lined with shelves, and on most of the shelves were hundreds of packets of pages. Each packet was held together with stout loops of string. The packets leaned against each other at angles and lay in untidy stacks. Some were thick and some were so slim that only a clip was needed to hold them together. The pages of the oldest packets were yellowed and warped, and their edges were uneven rows of ripples. These were the Books of Ember, written over the years by its citizens. They contained in their close written pages that was imagined and everything that was known. Edward Pocket looked up and nodded briefly at Dune, one of his most frequent visitors. Dune nodded back. He went into the fact room to the section of the shells labeled F. The books were arranged by subject, but even so, it wasn't easy to find what you wanted. A book about moths, for instance, might be under M for moths, or I for insects, or B for bugs. It might even be found under F for flying things. Usually, you had to browse through the entire library to make sure you'd found all the books on one subject. But since he was looking for fire, he thought he might as well start with F. Fire was rare in Ember. When there was a fire, it was because there had been an accident. Someone had left a dish towel too close to an electric burner on a stove, or a cord had frayed and a spark had flown out of an ignited curtains. Then the citizens would rush in with buckets of water and the fire was quickly drowned. But it was, of course, possible to start a fire on purpose. You could hold a sliver of wood to the stove burner until it burst into flame, and then for a moment it would flare brightly, giving off orange light. The trick was to find a way to make the light last. If you had a light that would keep going, you could go out into the unknown regions and see what was there. Finding a way to explore the unknown regions was the only thing Dune could think to do. He took down a book from the F shelf, Fungus it was called. He put it back. The next book was called How to Repair Furniture. He put that back too. He went through foot diseases, fun with string, coping with failure, and canned fruit recipes before he finally found a book called All About Fire. He sat down at one of the library square tables to read it. But the person who had written the book knew no more about fire than Dune. Mostly the book described the dangers of fire. A long section of it was about a building in Winifred Square that had caught fire 40 years ago and how all its doors and all its furniture had burned up and smoke had filled the air for days. Another part was about what to do if your oven caught on fire. Dune closed the book and sighed. It was useless. He could write a, bu a better book than that. He got up and wandered restlessly around the library. Sometimes you could find useful things just by choosing randomly from the shelves. He had done this so many times, just reached out and grabbed something, in the hope that by accident he might come upon the very piece of information he needed. It would be something that another person had written down without understanding its significance. Just a sentence or two that would be like a flash of light in Dune's mind, fitting together with things he already knew to make a solution to everything. Although he'd often found something interesting in those searches, he'd never found anything important. Today was no different. He did come across a collection of mysterious words from the past, which he read for a while. It was about words and phrases so old that their meanings had been forgotten. He read a few pages. Heavens above indicates surprise. What heavens mean is means is unclear. It might be another word for floodlight. Hogwash means nonsense, though no one knows what a hog is or why one would wash it. Batting a thousand indicates great success. This might possibly refer to killing bugs. All in the same boat means all in the same predicament. The meaning of boat is unknown. Interesting, but not useful. He put the book back on the shelf and was about to leave when the door of the library opened and Lina Mayfleet came in.